So we would like for your questions to uh, to appear in uh, in the chat window. If you will, please uh, to <laughs> do that. And uh, Rena says that house in Petersburg is actually available for rental on Airbnb. However, the neighborhood is supposedly a bit sketchy. Believe it's called the Wallace House. And Sue, uh, are, you're you're muted, uh, Kurt. There is there's a road I think that runs right past it or very near it. That's called Squirrel Nut Road, I believe. Uh, there, I, I'm not sure about the origin of that name, but Squirrel Squirrel Nut Road is is very close by. I've been able to stand on that porch before I went up there and Will Green gave the uh, Civil War Photography Group a great tour and uh, was able to actually stand on the, the uh, porch where Grant and Lincoln met. All right. Sue Ann says hello to everyone from the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Uh, and Rena, Rena says something like $350 a night for the whole house. Yeah, big house too. Yeah, so uh, Ray uh, Barwick says hello from Ray in the UK. Ray, so good to have you. Thanks for joining us. You honor me, my UK friends. Uh, it, it's astonishing to me that so many of you folks join us because I know it's an awkward time for you folks in the UK, but thank you very much for joining us tonight. So uh, Al says, what's the name of the cemetery organization Kurt mentioned before the program began? The sanitary organization. I have to refresh my memory. I don't, I don't recall that. Well, what were we talking about? What was the context of the, of the statement? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't recall having mentioned the sanitary commission, but cemetery. Uh, oh, cemetery. Uh, it's the, I believe it's the, what is the Parker's Crossroads original cemetery and it's still in use. It has a name, but I don't recall it right now. If you uh, e-telegraph me, I'd be happy to let you know. I'll be back up there before very long. And Sergeant Major says, evening, Kurt. Greetings from New Market. In regards to your recent filming project, how many films have you been in and how, how were you selected for President Grant uh, at Saratoga? P.S. You and Miss Lena left the East too soon. New Market is holding an event this weekend. Uh, well, first, congratulations, Sergeant Major, on just having received your degree uh saw your graduation pictures cap and gown you know uh pomp and circumstance is the sweetest sound in the world when you're getting a degree and you put on the funny hat and the robe but congratulations for that you've now become a sergeant major in the united states army then you pursued and got a, a master's in history i'm proud of you tammy you, you you're doing good uh the films that i have been in uh i have I'm in the film that is shown in the visitor center at Appomattox with Thomas Jesse as General Lee uh, with malice toward none. We did that in uh, 2014 to show it uh, for the 150th, 2015. I'm in the film that is shown in the Dover Hotel uh, at uh, Fort Donaldson National Battlefield uh, unconditional surrender. And I am in the movie that is shown at Shiloh, a uh, fiery trial, <clears throat> but I'm not Grant. They filmed, we filmed that in, uh, 2011. And I had started doing my Grant portrayal in 2010. So nobody knew who I was. And Shiloh is only a hundred miles from where I live, where I'm sitting now. And uh, I, I went up there with a number of other reenactors to uh, be in the film if we could. And when I got there, 
uh, that, yeah, sure, great, we would want you in the film. But it was mentioned <laughs> that this guy looks too much like Grant. Uh, and, and Harry Bulkley did Grant in that film, and Harry did a great job. He's a good Grant. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet him, pleasure to work with him. And of course, I was just a little grand at that time. And I was standing in awe of the man who's actually doing Grant for this film. And uh, got to talk to him a lot and I got a couple of tips to, to do Grant stuff. And uh, it came up though, that you, you get, we gotta do something with you because we don't want anybody in the film confusing you with him. So what they did was they covered my face in black powder and dirt. Uh, and uh, I see you laughing, Mike. I, I see that. It doesn't escape me you're laughing. But I'm just smeared. You can't recognize me because I'm just blackened with all this dirt and mud and, and powder. Uh, and then uh, I, I think everybody tonight who likes the Grant character will appreciate the irony. I portrayed John McClernand. And uh, so in my first outing to do a film with the, or be in a film with the National Park Service, I played Grant's worst enemy. Uh, and I, I think I probably played him very poorly, which is, is does him justice when you come to think about it. But I'm in fiery trial for about, I think I'm on screen about six seconds. But I got in the credits, so I was pleased with that. And I did Appomattox, and I did Dover, and they we just did last week uh, the film that I'm really proud of this, uh, the film that is going to be premiered at the Grant National Monument in New York City in December. And this is going to be shown well, at least the, the word is, it's going to be shown for probably for several decades. And uh, they cover, I'm not sure how long it's going to be, but they cover young Grant, their Ben Kemp, K-E-M-P, Ben Kemp, who is the operations director for the Grant Cottage at uh, Wilton, New York, uh, plays me as a lieutenant courting Julia. And there's a beautiful scene on the front porch of the, of the Grant home where uh, young Grant is squiring Julia and uh, he, he's making his play for Julia. Uh, and it was funny for me to be standing over behind the camera, behind the fourth wall, uh, watching me court my wife. Uh, and it's very well done. They, uh, ben also does uh, some tent scenes in the Mexican War where Lieutenant Grant's writing a letter <clears throat> to Julia. And they've got me uh, as the uh, retired President Grant. And we're, we're playing the financial disaster when he has, has found out that he's now broke. And uh, Northern Light Productions in Boston did it. And when I talked to Lenny Rotman, the producer, he contacted me and he said, do you know a, a, a Julia? And I said, I just happen to know someone who could do Julia. And then when I told Lena, she said, OMG, I'm going to be on, on the, in the film. I'm, I'm, I can't get in front of a camera. Yeah, you can just sit there and be quiet. And, and which is essentially what she does. Uh, so it'll be my fourth uh, National Park Service film, and uh, they they picked me. Well, the Park Service recommended that I portray Grant in it, and uh, since I've done Shiloh, and or I did Appomattox and uh, Dover, what they're going to do, and it's brilliant. Uh, what they're going to do is they shot a lot of footage of me that they're gonna use in other films at, at other grant locations, uh, which I think is great because they, they can take me and I, I kind of, and I, I qualify that a bit, I'm, I'm kind of the, the grant for the park service. So when they use me, they can put me in any film at any park that they want and everywhere you go, you see the same grants. So 
there's some uniformity in that. And that's that's how I got picked. Uniformity, uh, is that a pun? Uh, a bad one, yes. <laughs> um, Rex would like to know, uh, what do you know about General Hobie, uh, who was with you at Champions Hill? I don't know much about Hovey, uh, and I, I can't speak to him. I'd have to go back and do some research before I could make any kind of a, a knowledgeable statement. And that's something else that I want people to know. I am not a fill in the blank historian. And if I don't know, I'm going to tell you, I don't know. Uh, and that's imperative because it's a, it's a travesty. And I've heard living historians do this, that they just, they run that mouth and say whatever they want to. And people that are listening to you, they trust you. There, there is a trust for living historians. And that, that's, a, that's a really serious and heavy burden for anyone who does a living historian portrayal in first person because what comes out of your mouth is going to be taken as gospel by the people listening to you. So do not put the virus of inaccuracy into the historical body. The, so don't, uh, that, that's, that's a, a, a capital offense in history. Uh, Chuck Calhoun, who wrote The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, Dr. Charles Calhoun, said something in a presentation at Mississippi State that I want to say here. He said, you know, people, the old saying is that history repeats itself. Well, I'll tell you, it's not that history repeats itself. It's that historians keep repeating each other. Uh, do your research. Don't Just because it's printed in a book doesn't mean it's true. So do your own research. So with General Hovey, I, I know he, he was a, a significant player in that campaign, but I'm not knowledgeable enough about General Hovey to answer your question, Rex. I'd have to do some research before I could speak knowledgeably, as Grant would speak, without having to think and give you his thoughts on General Hovey. Jerry would like to know, uh, Kurt, where do you plan to spend Grant's 200th birthday next April 27th? Good evening, Mr. President. It is good that you once again join us. You grace us with your presence. Uh, I am going, of course, uh, that gives me a platform. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, 2022 is Grant's bicentennial birth year. And of course, every day that goes by now is also the sesquicentennial of his presidency. So there's a duality going on here for Grant and history. Uh, I'm for his uh, birth date, I'm going to be in Georgetown, Ohio, his uh, hometown. He was born in Point Pleasant, Ohio on the banks and it is physically on the banks of the Ohio River. When he was 11 months old, his parents moved to Georgetown, Ohio, about 10 miles away, a little further away from the river. And he spent from 11 months to 17 years, almost exactly to 17. He turned 17 April 27th and in May he was gone to West Point. But I will be there during Grant Days, which is always the third weekend of uh, April. And uh, actually, I'll, I'll tell you, I can tell you this much. This is a flash. Uh, they're going to have in uh, the Gaslight Theater, which was built in 1909 and has been completely redone. Wonderful theater facility that seats about 500. Uh, that they're going to have a two part program, a morning and an evening program whereby General Gr uh, President Grant is going to be interviewed. And uh, the, the uh, interviewer who has committed is uh, Dr. Charles Calhoun, who wrote The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, came out in 18. I urge you all to read that. I don't have stock in, in Chuck Calhoun's book sales, but I will tell you it is a profound analysis 
of Grant's presidency. And uh, anyone who's a Grant fan or anywhere close to being a Grant fan uh, should read Charles Calhoun's book, The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant. And Charles Calhoun has committed to interview me as President Grant in, on stage in the Gaslight Theater. So I'm thrilled. I, I'm thrilled about that. They're still trying to get a, someone from the military. They've got somebody in mind, but they're, they're having trouble with that at, at this point uh, to get the particular person they want. If they don't get that individual, we've got several other options. So they're going to, on his birthday or the weekend of his birthday, uh, there's going to be a two-part uh, interview by significant people in our country of uh, President Grant. And it's going to be a freewheeling interview, uh, nothing scripted. They're going, they're going to, I'm going to sit down, light a cigar, and they're going to light into me. <laughs> like Chris Mikowski says, uh, without a net, huh? Without, without a net. Uh, Charles Calhoun, I'm told, said that, uh, and we have met, uh, I told him that I thought his book, The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, was the third volume of Grant's memoirs. And he was taken aback. I, I praise him for that. He, he physically stepped back. He said, that's, that's how I praise. And I told him, I think it is. The book is that well written. It is that informative. Uh, it's that readable. But it also deals with Grant's presidency, both terms which Grant did not address in his memoirs, except to say, I was twice elected president of the United States. So Chuck Calhoun's book uh, is, it, it answers that need. You, you read Grant's two volumes, you get the war, you read Chuck Calhoun's book, The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, you get his presidency. And then Edwina Campbell wrote, A Citizen of a Greater Commonwealth, which deals with his trip around the world and after he got back. And that's the fourth volume of Grant's memoirs because that trip around the world was extremely significant, dictating politics and approaches our, our policies unto this very day. Uh, and, and essentially it is because Grant was the most popular man in the world. And as he went around the world for two and a half years, he met with every head of state imaginable. Uh, but you see, they thought that they weren't only meeting with an ex-president. They all thought from Bismarck to the emperor of Japan that they were meeting with the next president because they all thought Grant was going to come back to America and run for a third term. Uh, and Grant, Grant did some negotiating. He did, he, he tried to get a treaty between the Japanese and, and the Russians. They didn't listen to his advice, uh, and they lost the war. The Japanese did, but, um, it, it, it's well worth reading, uh, Citizen of Great Commonwealth and the Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant by Edwin Campbell and Chuck Calhoun. But I will be spending much of 2022 in and around the Georgetown, Ohio area. Sue Ann noticed my Smoky Bear shirt. Thank you, Sue Ann. And um, uh, Ron says, greetings from Virginia. Do you find yourself going into character in your everyday life? Occasionally, Ron. Ron and Kathy, my good Virginia friends. Uh, Kathy has taken at least two pictures that are among my very favorites and Tom Jesse, General Robert E. Lee, uh, our collective favorites. Kathy's a great photographer and it. Kathy has managed to be at, at uh, Appomattox and caught Thomas and I in some, in some wonderful photographs. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Do I find myself going into character occasionally? Uh, it, <clears throat> there's, a, <laughs> there's a blurring of the lines between myself and Grant sometimes. Uh, and it, it, it comes about, I think, primarily because of the, uh, the, the emphasis <clears throat> of when I'm, I am being Grant. 
of not slipping up. Now I have <clears throat> in in almost 12 years, I'm in my 12th year of doing grant. I have only only twice, <clears throat> excuse me, slipped up and said, I got an email from some from general somebody. <laughs> and of course that that puts the audience in a roar and, and everybody has a good laugh. Uh, and that's why you may notice that I am always using the word uh, e-telegraph me or send me a telegram. And I do that to stay with telegraph and telegram rather than slip into the unconscious of emails and, and logins and so forth. And that's, that's why I refer to Zoom as the new telegram. I, occasionally, I, I have slipped up and slipped into Grant, but I quickly stepped back into the 21st century. Uh, Ray says, uh, glad to be here, Kurt. And Karen says, are you still finding out new things about Grant that you did not know before? And is there anything about Grant's personal life or his personality that you don't like, yet you must portray this accurately? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, I, I learn something new about Grant every week. Uh, I, I, it, it was for a long time every day, uh, but it's, it's kind of smoothed out to where it's every week now. Uh, to learn things about, uh, like he wore a size nine shoe. And I, I read that, I think it was in Ishbel Ross's book, the president's wife, uh, but he, he wore a size nine shoe. Uh, he, uh, his, the horse he was riding at Shiloh when it fell on him was Fox. Uh, the horse he was riding in Chattanooga uh, a couple of years later that fell on him again on the same left leg was old Jack. Uh, Cincinnati or Jack rather in 60 well, sometime in 64 he was in Chicago at the Sanitary Commission Fair and he uh, donated Jack to them to sell and they got four thousand dollars for him now four thousand dollars in 1964 multiply that by at least 25 in our money and you're going to be at the low end of close. Uh, he, he, his favorite breakfast, I, I had a, a boy uh, in Andersonville, Indiana, when I was making a talk up there at the library and about 150 people in the room. And I opened it up for question and answer. And I had just learned this. So he, th this, this kid asked me something at an opportune time because it was on the top of my mind. Uh, but he he was nine years old, I found out after it, and it, mom had brought him. And he was waving the hand just you know, like a kid will do, just excited. And I, I, I called him, so, uh, some adults had raised their hands and I put them apart and said, young man back there in, against the wall. And he said, General Grant is his most dignified voice. He said, what's your favorite breakfast? And this, this ripple, as, as you might expect, of laughter rolled all the way around the room. And I said, tut, tut, that's a good question. That's a legitimate question. I have, and I hadn't, I said, I had never been asked what my favorite breakfast was. And this young man back there, it's important to him. It's important to him. At his age, what you eat for breakfast is a big occasion, and he wants to know what I have for breakfast, what my favorite meal was. My favorite meal for breakfast is sliced cucumbers dipped in cold pickle brine. And of course, the ooh, ooh, the face comes out of the kid, and everybody around the room is going, ooh, ooh, but I had just learned that. Uh, and it's little things like that when one is a living historian that, that you need to dig and look for because it's the little things like that that humanize you, that, that it, there's a twofold purpose. It humanizes you 
and it it impresses people that wow you really know your character you know um, i've had people ask me what grant's favorite dessert was it was uh, sugar cookies and uh pudding rice pudding was his favorite were his favorite desserts uh are there things about grant that i don't like that i have to do in person uh, I haven't found anything about Grant that I don't like, <clears throat> but I don't like having to say or saying when I'm talking about Shiloh that I was not surprised. Because in uniform, in character, I must say that because Grant was adamant uh, and to say, at Belmont that uh, he wasn't defeated. Well, there's some there's some argument about whether or not Grant won or lost Belmont. Usually it's that he lost. Uh, Grant got caught with his britches down at, badly at Belmont. It was his first combat command. It's the first time Grant had led troops into combat as the commanding officer. And I can, I, this is not the time and place, but I could tell you three or four things, maybe more mistakes, bad mistakes that he made in Belmont. And he got out only by the hardest. But I, in character, have got to say because he said it. And while I do not put words in his mouth, I can't take and I will not take words out of his mouth. If Ulysses S. Grant says, I wasn't surprised at Belmont and I won Belmont, then that's what I say when I'm talking about Grant at Belmont. Same thing with Shiloh. Grant says, uh, if you think I was surprised, no, sir. No, sir. Think again. I knew they were out there and uh, he was expecting, so I was expecting Johnston because I'm waiting on Buell who's dragging his sword. Uh, Johnston may take advantage of that delay and hit me on, I was really expecting it on the ninth, perhaps even the eighth, but certainly not the sixth. Now, Grant said that, and it, it's not fun for me to say, no, I wasn't surprised at Shiloh, when we all know he was, but in character, I have the, the stricture of having to say what he said. Now, out of character, I, I'm, I have the freedom to say we all know what really happened. But that's what I don't like about Grant. And I, I haven't found any characteristic about Grant that I don't like. Robert Ford uh, would like to know, what was your relationship with General Butler and what is your opinion of him? Well, we're blending here, Robert. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, but we're blending here between me and him. Uh, let me answer this way, uh, because that, that could well be another program where I talk about Butler, but I would want to talk about Butler as President Grant, because Butler was a thorn in Grant's paw uh, as a, a political appointee general who had no idea what in the world he was doing. Uh, he, he tried to blow up Fort Fisher and he wound up blowing up barges and, and I think part of the Navy. Uh, he was supposed to have taken Petersburg. He goes to Petersburg, he camps, goes into camp. There were only 1,500 old men and boys who were guarding them uh, at that time. And then he pulls back into when, when Beauregard shows up with what, 30,000 or so men, I believe that's how many he had. But you get a combat veteran who's a fighter like Beauregard who, who's brought in and your, your 1,500 children and old men fade to the back ranks and you've got some combat hardened veterans who are saying, come ahead on Yank. Uh, and that's who Butler was facing. Beauregard pushes Butler back into Bermuda 100 pops a cork in the jug, and I've lost, as Grant, 30,000 or more men, and Butler's completely useless to me now. Uh, as a congressman, he was, a, and, and as Grant being president, he was a thorn in Grant's other paw, front paw, because Butler did not forget that Grant had sacked him 
in command of the army of the James uh, as quickly as he could. In fact, wanted to sack him several times and Lincoln wouldn't let him do it until Lincoln had won re-election. And then once he got back and secured the second term, uh, he let Grant do pretty much as he wished with dumping all of the leaders that were in the Western, uh, the Eastern theater before he got there. And he proceeded to in that 11 months that he was in the Eastern Theater, he relieved every commanding general, every one of them, except George Meade. And Butler was one of them. But then four years later, when Grant becomes president, Butler is in Congress at that time from Massachusetts. And Butler has a real good memory about what Grant had to say about him and what Grant was able to do to him. Uh, but that's beyond that. That's another program, but I, I'm glad you brought up the issue about Grant's relationship with Butler. And final thought on that, I have not one, but two chamber pots with Butler's picture in the bottom. <laughs> Rena would like to clarify uh, that you were talking about chasing history cemeteries or something like that. Yeah, it's chase, chasing history cemeteries. It's on Facebook. Uh, and I urge all of you to go there because all of you live near interesting cemeteries and whether you admit it or not, you all go to cemeteries and, and look at the tombstones. We all do that. It's, it's in the DNA of a person who loves history and uh, it, it uh, get on chasing history cemeteries and submit some of those pictures because we're all looking uh, for interesting tombstones and people that you found and uh, a coast to coast from, from Oregon to Virginia would be wonderful. Uh, John Hartman, you folks up there in, in Oregon and Washington, uh, send us some pictures from the cemeteries you got there because people are not aware that there were so many Confederate and federal veterans in Washington and Oregon State. They, they're they're uh, a lot of them up there. In fact, one of the biggest uh, uh, Confederate vet UCV, United Confederate Veterans Camps was in, I think, Washington, either Washington or Oregon, uh, I think Washington, and there were some huge federal GAR camps up there, and, and people, too few people are aware that the, after the war, so many of those soldiers, particularly Southerners who came back to rubble and ruin, migrated out west. Actually, I have documented over 8,400 uh, Civil War veterans buried in the state of Washington. How about that? For you. And, and you ought to put them all on chasing history cemeteries, Mark. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll take a moment. Uh, Michelle would like to know if uh, this isn't too intrusive to ask, what did your family think of you taking on this new chapter of your life as General Grant? No controversy, just okay. That's what Kurt's doing. Pretty much that. That's... A prophet is without honor in his own home. <laughs> Paul says, hi from Pittsburgh, proud second great grandson of a 27th Kentucky U.S. sergeant. Connect with us. And Doug says, besides the official records and other various writings, how much do you rely on the 32 volumes grant papers in your preparation? Also, I know you mentioned John Marslack. However, did you ever meet the late Dr. John Simon uh, while the papers were housed and published by Southern Illinois University, the Salukis? I, I have my own set of the grant papers, and I will give you all a tip if you want the grant papers. I know they're online. Uh, you don't have to buy them, but you can get them from SIU for $50 a copy in a shrink wrap, brand new, because when the grant library moved to Mississippi State, uh, SIU had had thousands, they, they got hundreds, if not thousands of complete sets of the grant papers. There's 33 volumes. And uh, they were selling for $100 per copy. Now you can get them for $50 a copy, brand new. And you can get a set for, I think it's $1,500 for the complete set 
in the at, shipped to you. So if you're interested in getting one or all of them, uh, SIU will sell them now. In fact, SIU doesn't have them. A book jobber in Chicago has them all in the warehouse and they'd be very pleased to sell them. I use the papers a lot. Uh, I go back and, and read them to find what he was uh, writing or doing at that time of whatever the event is that I'm, I'm preparing for. Uh, I also use the ORs here. I got a complete set of the ORs, a uh, complete set of the Southern historical, military historical, uh, which is the, the Southern version of the ORs. I got a complete set of the Navy right now. You can't see I, uh, but the complete set of the Navy ORs. And I, I go to them a lot because they've got the orders and the notes and communications. Uh, and I, I use them a lot, a, a great deal. I have come to rely heavily on them. Uh, and what was the last part of the question? Uh, about John Simon. Oh, no, I never met Dr. Simon to my regret and my loss. I've met his wonderful, delightful pixie wife, uh, 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 I'm drawing a blank on her name, but uh, she's a doll. She's just wonderful. And she's one of the uh, stalwarts in the Ulysses S. Grant Association. And I'm a, a, a life member of that, uh, which I guess is no surprise. Uh, Harriet, Harriet Simon. And Harriet's about five feet tall and just a pixie. Uh, and I regret that I never got to meet Dr. Simon. I understand he was a very powerful man and, and entrancing when he spoke of Grant. Karen would like to know where you went to college and what was your major? I went to uh, the University of Memphis and I got a bachelor's degree in secondary education with endorsements to teach history and sociology. Then I got a master's degree in educational administration and supervision from Memphis. Uh, and then I later, in just a few short years, I went to Michigan State University and I got another master's degree in secondary education and a PhD in ed double major educational administration and curriculum from Michigan State University. Go green, go white. That's right. So uh, Robert Flood says, when you learn something new and important about US Grant, how do you make sure you incorporate this new knowledge in your persona? And do you take notes or simply automatically internalize the new info? Uh much of it, Robert, is internalizing them uh, because when I read something that uh, is, is a, the wow factor, uh, it's, it's easy to remember. Uh, I'm also working on a book, uh, which is about all I want to say at this time about that, but about Grant in the Western Theater. And uh, uh, when I do prep for that, or when I do preparation for the Fridays with Grant, uh, I consult my resources. See, it sounds so much better. It's really classy to say I consult my resources and said, I'll read these, the books I got. Uh, but I consult my resources and I make notes and uh, I have a number of, of books. I've, I've got about 2000 books in my personal library. Uh, I've been buying books since I was 10 years old. Books are my friends. You know, I, I just, I can't pass by a book without sticking it on the shelf. Uh, but I, I take notes and then I type the notes and I read them several times because I've got like Gene Edward Smith and uh, Jeffrey Perez, uh, Ron White, Ron Cherno. Uh, the memoirs uh, from the Mississippi State version, the annotated memoirs of Liz S. Grant, predominantly some of the Liz Samet you know, and, and, and memoirs of Grant. 
And so when you read all of those books, and then I, I go back and I've got a lot of books. I, I like to buy, uh, let me, I'm going to part the, the water here for a moment and tell you what I like in my reading. In reading about Grant, I, I much prefer books that are published <clears throat> before 1920. Uh, because there are three categories of those books. One, the, the top tier is uh, books written by people who actually knew Grant. You know, Horace Porter, for example, uh, and uh, people who knew him and they described him like Grant's voice. Porter describes Grant's voice. Uh, he spoke in a baritone voice in measured phrases. And uh, it was either Porter or Theodore Bauer. Bauer is the guy who said he's gonna put his head through a brick wall. It well, looks like he's about to do it. Uh, Bauer, I think is the one who said uh, he had the most melodious and beautiful voice I ever heard. It was a pleasure to listen to him speak. Now that's the first tier of books, people who knew Grant. The second tier of books published before 1920 is uh, the people who did not personally know Grant, but they knew people who knew Grant. They're, they're first generation removed contemporaries. And uh, they write knowledgeably about Grant. And the third tier is people who didn't know Grant or didn't know anyone who knew Grant but they're still writing in the 1865 to 1915, 1920 timeframe. So they're writing in the mindset of the Victorian age. And sometimes their, their prose is a little difficult to write. It's stilted. And, uh, you know, like it, now you might say he hollered before that it was he exclaimed and for them he ejaculated was a term that they used to, for a burst of enthusiasm, spontaneous utterance. Uh, so th the third tier of writer is someone who's writing in the mindset of the period. And they know they've read the newspapers and they're influenced by people who did not like Grant as well as those who did. So there are three tiers of people, books before 1920. Uh, but I, the prep, for example, for Fridays with Grant, uh, I do two days of prep for each one of those. So when you see 20 or 30 minutes of recorded video, uh, that's, that's 16 to 20 hours at least of research time that's gone into those programs and sometimes more. Uh, but I, I, I take the notes and I keep them. And of course, they're all going to ultimately find their way in, I think, into a book. You know, that's mighty big talk about I'm, I'm writing a book. We'll see. Uh, but I, I hope I've answered your question, Robert. Sergeant Major says, sir, you do me a great honor. Thank you for the kind words. <laughs> I know they are genuine. What are the dates of the premiere? It's all I know at this time. Uh, is the folks at Northern Light Productions said, our deadline is to have it done by November. And the Park Service rep that was there supervising and, and watching what's going on, she said they're wanting it for uh, probably, uh, if not definitely, in December. And uh, I, I don't know the significance of December with Grant uh, the death uh, or, or birth, there, there's no connection there, but they, that's the, the timetable that they're on. Uh, so it'll be available in, I think, in December. It will also be available on YouTube, on the NPS channel, or the Grant National Monument Facebook page. You're not going to have to go to up, upper I think Upper East Side on the Hudson River there, uh, not the Hudson, the, the East River, I think it is, uh, to the monument to see the film. Although you should, you, you should come pay me a call. Janine would like to know, were you ever approached to play General Grant in the recent documentary that was shown on the History Channel? 
No, much to my chagrin, I was not. Uh, the fellow who did grant, uh, and I, I'll make some comments, unsolicited comments about the three-part series. The fellow who did grant, uh, I believe is from New Zealand. Now, maybe somebody who's with us tonight knows better, but uh, I understand he's a New Zealand actor or Australian. They filmed it in, in Africa. I, I just found that out in Saratoga Springs, New York up there with the, the film crew. Uh, they filmed that, in, I, I think, in Africa. Uh, he did a good Grant. He did a good job. I think that the series treated Grant well, that uh, it, they, they treated him very positively. Uh, and it, it did much good for Grant. It did much good. Now, all of us who are, are in history, <clears throat> particularly those of us who are reenactors, you can find things wrong with anything. Uh, but the public, the general public, is not going to see those gaps. And I, I, I give you, I give you two. In all of the pic, all of the scenes where Grant is, let me sit up a bit. Look at his coat, his frock coat. It's folded back, straight back to that first row of buttons that goes down both sides of the coat. Grant never, ever buttoned his coat like that. That's a Confederate configuration. Confederate generals and officers folded their coats straight back and down. Federal officers folded theirs like you always see mine that uh, in the top row of three buttons, the middle button is folded over to its matching button on the outside of the coat, which forms a lapel because those coats don't have collars that lay down, they stand up. But when you button it over, it forms a lapel, makes it look more like a civilian cut coat. But that's such a small thing. And the scene in, uh, at Fort Donaldson, now, Fort Donaldson was fought in 15 to 20 degree below zero weather. It was so cold that the men couldn't work their fingers to load and fire their muskets. There were no fires. It snow was deep on the ground. But the scene that they show of Grant at Donaldson, they're walking through a trench that uh, I strongly suspect well, it might have been dug for the scene. They're only in the scene about 10, 15 seconds. Uh, but the trench is about 12 feet deep with a firing step where you got to step up to fire over the top of the trench. And it's about 25 or 30 feet wide. You could drive an Abrams tank down through that trench and never hit anybody. There was nothing like that anywhere near Fort Donaldson. The deepest thing they dug at Fort Donaldson was a slit that you could lie in. But that's the kind of thing that 99.99% .99 of the people don't know. And it doesn't turn them off. The movie did much great good to lift up recognition uh, at, uh, and, and awareness of Grant at minimum. So I was very pleased with the series and with the man who played Grant. I hope I get to meet him sometime. Uh, and I, I'd love for Leonardo uh, to call DiCaprio to call me and say, hey, I want you to be Grant in my next movie, but I don't think that's going to happen. Wow, I think we're chagrined over that. <laughs> Fernando, <laughs> Fernando says, good evening, everyone. In my opinion, there are very few movies or TV series about the Civil War inspired or based, filmed by the big studios of Hollywood or the main commercial TV channels. And in none of them, General Grant is a main character. No comparison to the number of Western movies, including those spaghetti Westerns filmed in Italy. What do you think about that? Well, let me say this about that. Uh, always remember that Hollywood uh, is out to sell a movie. 
and they conflict is what sells movies conflict between lovers conflict between family members conflict between armies or generals so there's got to be conflict the they've only got for example i said uh, that that trench scene with general grant at uh, fort donaldson runs maybe 15 or 20 seconds that's a long time in a film that's a long time so they've got uh well for example war and peace which is must be 1500 2000 pages uh that tolstoy wrote there was one version that was made actually in the 20th century uh, that runs eight hours. Now they, in fact, in, in some places they would show four hours one night and four hours the next night. It was an eight hour movie. So they've got to take years of someone's life, Grant's life, uh, and condense it into about 80 or 90 minutes in a film. In that three-part series, I think it runs about four hour, five hours total. So they can't tell everything. They got to gloss over and hit the high spots. They're wanting to sell a story. And Hollywood is not interested much in accuracy. Uh, they, and I think maybe they're getting better. Uh, I hope they're getting better because now with reenactors, uh, they uh, they get accuracy in the uniforms if they'll only listen. Uh, and sometimes the producers, directors don't listen to what the reenactors say. I think Grant has been, he's usually a secondary character and he's usually portrayed as something uh, tippling or drunk. And that's so unfair to Grant, but Hollywood don't care to say it in the vernacular, Hollywood don't care what's fair or unfair to anybody. Uh, they want to sell movies. They want to sell tickets. So I, I take it with, which I hope all of you will, when I watch something from Hollywood or the History Channel, uh, it, it, always remember they're trying to sell a product. And uh, tr accuracy is not always exciting. So that's how I feel about that. Uh, the Horse Soldiers. The movie The Horse Soldiers is loosely based uh, on Grierson's raid during Grant's campaign for Vicksburg. And it's, it's close. It's, it's close. It's entertaining history. And hopefully, and I'm using this as an example, the horse soldiers would motivate people to say, you know, I'd like to know more about that. Uh, let me now we say, let me Google that. Let me get a book on that and read about Grierson's raid. And of course, we all know once you read the truth about anything in history, it's usually a lot better than the movie. So th those are my feelings, Fernando, on that. And by the way, welcome. It's so good to see you, uh, so to speak, uh, from uh, Venezuela. Uh, you honor me and humble me by attending regularly. You're a stalwart. John would like to know, uh, what is the best biography of General Grant? Well, I'll tell you what I like, uh, and that is by no means inclusive, exclusive. Uh, the books that I have found, my go-to books, when I want to find out something about Grant, and I've already actually mentioned them, I like, uh, to go back just a few years, uh, Gene Edward Smith's book, Grant. Uh, he wrote that, I guess, a decade, a couple of decades ago, and, and we just lost Dr. Grant, uh, Dr. Uh, Smith, just last year, I think. But he wrote his book, Grant. Excellent book. It, it's one of the first ones that I'll go to to pick up. Gene Edward Smith, Grant. I really like uh, Ron White's book, American Ulysses. I like Cherno's book, uh, Grant. I like, uh, I like Jeffrey Perret or, or Perret. I, I don't know how he pronounces it. I think it might be Perret. Uh, he wrote a book, I think Grant, and I like it. Uh, the McFeely book about Grant for which he won a Pulitzer Prize. I like that, but in a teeth grinding uh, way. 
because when I read that, every time I read anything from it, I think he really didn't like Grant. Why did this guy write a book about Grant? He didn't like him, uh, or that's what I get from it. Uh, but I like to read that because if you really want to know about a character, read what the people who didn't like him had to say. Uh, and you get, you get another facet. Uh, I like Edwina Campbell's book, Citizen of a, a Greater, Larger Commonwealth. And I, I certainly like uh, Charles uh, W. Calhoun, Chuck Calhoun's book, The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, I like anything Ed Barr wrote. And uh, I like anything Bruce Catton wrote. Uh, the trilogy... Captain Sam Grant, uh, Grant Moves South, and Grant Takes Command are three excellent books. In fact, Captain Sam Grant is, I, in my opinion, the best book about Grant, uh, his early life, and up through St. Louis, his St. Louis years. Captain Sam Grant uh, by Lloyd Lewis. Uh, Lloyd wrote that and had the very bad uh, misfortune to promptly die. Uh, at I think age 50, it had just come out, Captain Sam Grant, but uh, he was great friends with Bruce Catton, and not long, I think when his widow was able to get it together and, and talk about it, uh, she got with Bruce Catton, and Lord had already indicated that he would like Bruce to finish it, so Bruce Catton wrote uh, Grant moves south and Grant takes command. So you got a trilogy written by two different men, but Catton got all of, of L Lloyd Lewis's research. And of course, we all know how well Catton writes. So uh, anything by Bruce Catton, Captain Sam Grant was my favorite early Grant book. Uh, and I, I think that's enough. I, there are a lot of them that I like, but those are my go-to books. The first ones I pick up. James would like to know, do you have any ancestors in your family that were involved in the Civil War? Yes, I do. I've, I've got one that I know of, and he fought in the 12th Mississippi Company H, Army of Northern Virginia, and is buried in the Confederate Cemetery behind Beauvoir in Biloxi, Mississippi, T.P. Stewart. All right. So Jerry would like to clarify that the question about uh, the 200th anniversary was asked by the other Jerry from St. Louis. Oh, Jerry Rinaldi. Good, Jerry. Well, and to go back to that, uh, I've, I've got, at this point, there are proposed six different uh, engagements during 2022 observing Grant's bicentennial birth year. Uh, including that one that's going to have Charles Calhoun uh, interviewing President Grant and a military, some significant military figure is going to be interviewing President Grant as well. Uh, I will be, in fact, this July 23rd, I will be appearing, I think, virtually. I may actually be there, but it's probably going to be a virtual appearance, appearance uh, in St. Louis for the Ulysses S. Grant Symposium. Uh, on his uh, death date of July 23rd, and I will be in St. Louis again on July 23rd of 2023 uh, as President Grant on his death date. So it's going to be a busy 2022 and I think 2023. Jerry Payne says, one of Lincoln's sayings is you can't believe everything you see on the internet that's great wisdom <laughs> mr <laughs> president that's that's great wisdom i live by that i i think we all do alan and pam says we're vermonters with relatives who fought in vermont units can you give us any recollection or comments on vermont units or people assigned with you i all i can say about that is from my reading and, and studies, that the Vermonters distinguished themselves in combat, uh, covered themselves with glory was the, the contemporary term. 
I can't speak of any specific units uh, or specific officers or men. Uh, just know that uh, their, their combat performances uh, have distinguished themselves down through the years. Ray says both Grant and so many other Army leaders and commanders have made some truly fabulous comments and quotations. Is there one in particular that made by Grant that is your all-time favorite? I am in to do all I can. <laughs> uh, uh, he, he said that on the night of April the 18th of 1861, <clears throat> he had just chaired a recruiting uh, meeting for the, the men of Galena, Illinois. And uh, he had told them in that meeting that of course they were all clamoring to sign up. There were no, Grant was the only, uh, I think there was one other referenced Mexican war veteran that lived in Galena, Illinois. So Grant was talking to a, a room, a meeting hall, town hall full of men who were exuberant and effervescent and enthusiastic, all three of those E words, to get in the army and fight the rebels. And Grant stood up and said, before you put your name on that paper, you need to know as much insofar as you may at this point, what you're getting into because you are going to march many miles more than you could ever imagine. You are going to sleep on the hard ground in cold and in heat. You are going to have hard fare to eat if indeed you have anything to eat. So before you sign that paper, know what you're getting into. Uh, and I like that. Uh, but as he was walking home that evening with his brother Orville, his younger brother Orville, uh, who was well, one of the two brothers. Well, actually, Orville was still working in the father's store there in Galena. Uh, Simpson was dying of tuberculosis. In fact, Simpson died in, in uh, April of 62 uh, or 61. And Grant couldn't attend his funeral because he was at, at, I think, Camp Yates in Springfield. But Simpson was dying of, of tuberculosis. But as they were walking home that night from the recruiting meeting, Orville said, well, I guess uh, I expect you'll be going back in the Army. And uh, Liz said, yes, I, I am. I thought I had done with the military uh, that I would never put on a uniform again. But with this crisis that we presently have <clears throat> with, with secession, I feel that the country that educated me and trained me and gave me a good life deserves my support. At a pause, and then he said, I am in to do all I can. And I think that of the many things that Grant said that I, that I quote or can quote, I think that sentence, I am in, to do all I can is, that is Grant. That is the man. That is, is his persona, his personality, his drive, his determination, the core value that was Ulysses S. Grant. I am in to do all I can. So yes, I have a favorite. All right. Uh, 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 uh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I, I lost my place. I was responding to someone. Here we go. Gary Moore says, when we were in the 150th Franklin with you and Lincoln, we talked about you as president never heard about your presidential years of 1869 through 77. Would this be another session uh, you can tell us about? That will be several sessions. <clears throat> when we were at the 150th of Franklin, uh, that was one of the liberties that a living historian has because Grant was not at Franklin. 
neither was Lincoln and Dennis Boggs was there as Lincoln, but we stayed away intentionally away from the line of battle and were there available uh, to do some talking when people wanted to and have pictures made. Uh, I was not portraying President Grant at that time because I did not want to have a double vision during the sesquicentennial of the war. Grant, as he told the president, I'm a soldier, I have a job to do, I have no interest in politics. My intent was that once the war was over, that uh, I would portray the president because after the sesquicentennial war, there, there's, no, there's no more double vision. People are not going to be confused if they see me at an event as General Grant, and then two or three months later, they see me at an event as President Grant during the war. Now, once the war was over, it, it's a different situation. I do president, and, and I waited until the uh, 2015 when the war was over. Um, and the the presidency, <clears throat> we could do, we could easily do Fridays with Grant for the next 43 segments of just his presidency. And uh, Mike and I have talked on several, we talk often, but uh, we've talked on several occasions about me doing uh, more of President Grant and I intend to, you know, the Grant did, Grant was the first, he was really our first civil rights president and uh, he championed the, the rights and protection of black citizens, newly freed. He uh, broke the Klan in 1874, absolutely destroyed the Klan, thousand men convicted of civil rights violations, uh, suspended the writ of habeas corpus in South Carolina in eight different counties, on and on. Uh, what he did with the Indians, uh, tried to resolve the Indian uh, issues and problems, which he was never able to do. He tried to stand between the, the North and the South uh, in Reconstruction and make <clears throat> the hell that was Reconstruction easier to bear for uh, Blacks in the South and for Southerners uh, and, and for the Northerners. He uh, was uh, the first president to sign into law a national park. Now, Teddy gets credit for it, but, but Grant signed the first part. Grant started that whole Panama Canal issue. Teddy gets credit for that, uh, but Grant started it. Transoceanic Commission, Grant initiated the Treaty of Washington, which to this day uh, protects uh, our <clears throat> fishing rights and sea ocean mineral rights between us and Canada and very amiably so. Uh, we've got the longest unfortified border in the world between our two countries, but it wasn't always so amiable. Uh, there were shots fired and, and we were about to go to war with Canada, but Grant calmed those waters and soothed that and in the Treaty of Washington, uh, settled the Alabama claims, uh, settled that border that runs through uh, close to New Nova Scotia uh, Newfoundland up there in the northeastern U.S., the Atlantic, uh, and people don't know that. Grant vetoed the uh, inflationary bill uh, in 72 and in 74 that, that would have wrecked our economy if he'd signed it, uh, and on and on. So there, there, then, then there's that two and a half years going around the world, and, and that I urge you to read Edwina Campbell's book, citizen of a greater commonwealth. It's fascinating uh, about what he did and what he accomplished that, that, as I said earlier, even unto this very day, impacts our policies and politics around the globe. So there's much yet to go about the presidency and still much yet to go about the war. Rosemary, I'd like to know when your wife Lena is filmed, how do the uh, cinematographers, see, I could actually say that, handle her visual challenge? Stop from the side. Uh, there, there is, I think there may be some fleeting direct facial, but the scene that was shot, 
she's bringing tea into the parlor. So there's a direct frontal there, but she comes in the hall and around and sits at the, the table in our parlor there. And the camera is behind her off to her right shooting across the right side of her face. Uh, so just like Julia, there's, there's very little frontal facial but oblique and side shots. They did it very well. Can't praise Northern Light Productions more highly uh, than, than I, I, I could yell. Uh, great crew, great company, wonderful people to work with, and they're, they're going to produce a, a, a good film. I, not because I'm in it, but it's going to be a really good film about Grant's life. Craig says another Grant. Cary Grant said, I pretended to be somebody I wanted to be until I finally became that person or he became me. Is that close to how you have adopted the Grant persona? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Every, all the time, it, it, at first it was conscious, but it's gotten to be, I'm in my 12th year of portraying Grant and I have morphed into thinking like Grant, and, and I frequently ask myself, what would Grant do? You know, WWGD, what would Grant do? Uh, and sometimes it governs my uh, actions, reactions, uh, and, and that's not detrimental. That's been a good, a good morphing and changing. Rex uh, says, favorite dessert, rice pudding or bread pudding? The last Q&A, you mentioned bread pudding. Wasn't uh, rice pudding Lincoln's favorite? I think it was Lincoln's favorite as well. <clears throat> but Grant liked it. He liked the sugar cookies. Uh, because he smoked so much, uh, he, he liked things that were uh, really sweet so he could taste them. His tongue was probably under a quarter of an inch of nicotine. Uh, so it had to, whatever he ate, had to be strongly spiced or flavored for him to get any flavor. A, a different Ray says, General, greetings from Cincinnati. Uh, do you recall if the two individuals that accompanied your dad and caused you to issue General Order Number 11 were the Mack brothers? I believe that they had a manufacturing plant in Cincinnati with a government contract to make union uniforms. Uh, what would be the spelling on that last name, Mike? No last name. I think it was uh, Caesar, Caesar, Caesar Kasky, K-A-S-K-I-E, I believe was one of the three Jewish gentlemen of uh, I've, I've got the book and I, I highly recommend uh, Grant and the Expelling of the Jews by David, um, I want to say Sarnoff, but that's, that's not it. Uh, Sartor, I can't think of his last name, but it's an excellent book, Grant and the Expelling of the Jews. It's not a long book, uh, but it's, it's an outstanding book. He did it uh, as his doctoral dissertation at a, at a Jewish university. And um, actually, I, I saw an interview with him where he said that when he did his doctoral defense, which is a pretty nail-biting uh, time for anyone defending your, your doctoral dissertation, but uh, he said that relatives of those three Jewish businessmen were at the defense for his dissertation, which became the book, Grant and the Expelling of the Jews. And he said they all three, I think there were three of them. He said, I was greatly relieved when all three of them after the defense was over, which ran some three or four hours, they praised him. They said, we, we like what you have done. You've told the truth and we like what you have done. Uh, but highly recommend the book, Grant and the Expelling of the Jews. Rena clarifies or says, uh, personally, I think the politics of the time, both within the Army and the administration and Congress, was a strong motivator for both Grant and Sherman 
to keep insisting on the no surprise at Shiloh, then they, they could never go back on that even after the war or lose their reputations. Sherman did say uh, that we made mistakes. Uh, I think it's in his, his own memoirs, which the, the memoirs of William T. Sherman by himself. <laughs> That's on the book by himself. Uh, I believe it's in his memoirs that Sherman said, we made mistakes early in the war for which if had we made them later in the war, we would have been cashiered out of the service, uh, which I think was a refreshing bit of candor for, for Sherman to have said. Uh, Grant in his memoirs lets uh, Lew Wallace off the proverbial hook uh, that he, he said the widow, Wallace's widow, had sent information to another general who had forwarded it to Grant, uh, giving some explanation for what uh, Lew Wallace did or did not do that day on April the 6th at Shiloh. And Grant said, uh, uh, I certainly hope I haven't caused any unnecessary pain or angst. I will not uh, criticize or condemn someone if I, uh, and will back up uh, and retract it once I know the truth. So in his memoirs, well, Grant was very kind to a number of people, uh, but uh, he let Wallace off the hook. And Wallace was already gone, but his widow was still alive. Jason says hi from New York State near Grant College on last Friday. Thank you for your speaking tour of Grant College. Well, it was a delight, Jason, to be up there. Uh, particularly enjoyed talking to you and going down to the Grant Overlook and looking over the Hudson River Valley. I remember that well. You're a good tour guide, and it was a delight meeting and talking with you and all of your uh, guide and docent family. And we had that family picture taken of all the guides and on the porch. We re recreated the Grant family uh, picture on the steps of the Grant Cottage and. It was a, a joy to be there. In fact, I'm glad you said something, Jason. I brought this. This, for my friends, is a flag that flew over the Grant Cottage. And uh, Ben Kemp, the operations director, who plays me as a lieutenant in the film that's, that will be shown in December at the Grant Monument. But Ben took this flag, it's got some good fade on it. Maybe you can see it with the light, uh, but it flew over the Grant Cottage for quite a while. And as a gift, I now have my own flag that flew over the Grant Cottage. And that was an unexpected pleasure from an unexpected treasure. Thank you so much, Ben Kemp, Jason, and all you folks that work and keep alive the Grant story at the Grant Cottage. You're a great bunch of people. Douglas says, in a conversation with a, uh, some nation builders, aka living historians at Colonial Williamsburg, they express serious concern of how history is being presented in current educational settings. In particular, the behind the scenes Patrick Henry character stated they, see, they are seeing young people who either have little idea or no appreciation of the founding fathers, other than being slaveholders, misogynists, and agents of Native American genocide. It was uh, said, <laughs> excuse me, it was said the current classroom teaching of US history stresses begins uh, with the passage of the 13th and 14th amendments. Therefore, as a living historian, have uh, you experience the same current educational currents and sentiments? I have not uh, directly. <clears throat> I've, I've not been challenged uh, by anyone like that. And I, I have not noticed it. I, I haven't noticed it in portraying Grant as a living historian. So. And I'm glad to be able to tell you, Douglas, I, I have not experienced it. Like everybody else, I have concerns about how our story is going to be told uh, going into the future. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, I will say, though, that 
it is incumbent upon all of us uh, to do all we can to promote and perpetuate our history accurately. You know, my mantra for Grant is I am in to do all I can uh, and to present and put forth Ulysses S. Grant in a positive and accurate manner. Uh, and that's what I strive to do. And all history should be put forth in that manner. Uh, and that's quite enough. Uh, Ray Barrick uh, says, uh, regarding cemeteries in the UK, it is quite surprising that quite a few who fought in the Civil War are buried in uh, some of the graveyards over here, like Colonel Fremantle and also members of the Selfridge family uh, whose service was to the Navy are uh, amongst some that I can mention and have found. Well, Bullock, uh, his family, many of his family are buried. And I think Bullock himself, who was the, the Confederate agent for getting the Confederate writers built at Laird and Sons in Liverpool, there are quite a few Confederate and federal, <laughs> it's not just Confederate, but quite a few federal uh, veterans. And the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the same thing is true for Australia. Uh, there is an active effort going on with my friends in Australia, uh, the American Civil War Roundtable of Queensland, particularly, uh, they're, they're actively, diligently looking for uh, Civil War veterans who are buried down there in the south uh, eastern part of Australia. Uh, and I think there are some Civil War veterans. Robert Taylor, Bob Taylor, who is the editor of The Bugle. And if you don't subscribe, all of you, if you don't subscribe to the, the Bugle newsletter, it's, in my opinion, the best Civil War newsletter out there. And Bob Taylor was an Australian. He now lives in New Zealand and he edits it. It's a monthly newsletter and he sends it around the world. So uh, look up Robert Taylor, the bugle and tell Bob that I told you to put him on or him to put you on the mailing list for the bugle. But uh, there are some Civil War veterans that are buried even in New Zealand. They're everywhere. We got to find them identify them, honor all of them. Karen says, I have never seen a reference in history books that Grant had a chamber pot with General Butler on it. Uh, did he really have one of those pots? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. I, I, I've got two uh, and they were both presented to me uh, for speaking uh, I spoke to the uh, Texas Civil War Museum in uh, Dallas or Fort Worth, and uh, I spoke to the New Orleans uh, Civil War Roundtable, and they too gave me uh, one. So the Texas Civil War Museum in Fort Worth and the New Orleans Civil War Roundtable both presented me with a Butler chamber pot. That's right, Dallas days and Fort Worth nights. Karen also would like to know how many children do you have, uh, do your, uh, you and your wife have, and uh, are they interested in history? I have no children. Uh, Lena has got two, two adult children. And uh, one granddaughter who is 12 uh, is expressing some interest in history, but more in being an interior designer. Uh, the others have little to no interest in history. Shannon would like to know, did you ever have contact with General George Pickett? He was stationed on San Juan Island in Washington State. I currently live just a few mi uh, minutes from where he and his troops lived on our island. I don't, I don't know that Grant ever cross paths with George Pickett. Uh, it's possible, it's, it's a good possibility uh, that they did at, at least meet, uh, but I, I don't know. I've never read anything where Grant and Pickett had a direct contact. Pickett's an unusual fellow. Uh, 
Rich Kepner and Beth Young told me about uh, Pickett being in Quincy, Illinois. He got his appointment to West Point when he was in Quincy, Illinois. Uh, supposed to have been a lawyer, as I recall, and didn't want to go into law. He got an appointment to West Point. Pickett's an unusual fellow in, in history, a uh, very interesting man. And uh, I don't, though, know if he and Grant ever actually met. Uh, we actually had lunch in the Pickett House in Bellingham. Uh, John uh, Washington says, there are many places we have together over the years. And uh, one thing I noticed about you, and that is you never turn down the chance to speak with a child. Thank you and Lena for working with Lincoln's general uh, over the years as one of our founding fathers. Very welcome, John, it's a joy. I like, uh, I like working with kids because they're, they're the future of our past. It, it comes down to that. Children are the future of our past. And if we don't fire them up to learn about their history or some part of it, uh, it, it whether it's ancient Mayans or Incans or Egyptians or, or Russian history, whatever, if we don't get them fired up about history, history is going to dissolve away. And uh, I like to think, I fondly like to think that maybe someday in 50 years uh, during the bicentennial of the Civil War, that there'll be somebody walk over one of these fields and say, you know, when I was a kid, I came here or there and I met General Grant, and that's when it all started for me. And now here I am, a history teacher. <laughs> I can't think of anything better as an, a, a career achievement uh, as portraying General and President Grant than to think that that would someday occur. That, that, because that's not that far as we know in the future. And some kid to say, I saw General Grant once and man, I got fired up. That's when it all started. Jerry Payne says, another great program, Kurt and Mike. Thank you. And Alan and Pam say, or ask, did you smoke cigars prior to being Grant or did you have to learn how to smoke them? Absolutely not. Uh, <clears throat> I, I am a total non-smoker. Uh, I played with it a little bit like everybody does in high school and college, but I'm a, I'm a total non-smoker, uh, I particularly not cigars. Those things leave a taste in my mouth like a camel crapped in it for about three days. And uh, it, and see, I want you to hear both of them, both sides of this, because uh, I, I found out quickly, like, my life paralleled Grant's career. The, the higher Grant rose in rank, the better quality of the cigars he got that he was given. Grant never bought a cigar. Uh, and I found out in smoking uh, these things that if you get a cheap cigar, uh, Scott Thomas, my mentor, and John Warsing knows Scott well. Scott uh, told me, get a good cigar. And uh, and, and I already knew get a big one that, because the, the small ones don't photograph well. And Scott said, get a, get a good cigar, spend six or $7 for it because the, the, the glue for the wrapper is not cheap. And on an inexpensive or cheap cigar, it pulls your lip, the skin off your lip because it doesn't have a good glue holding the cigar together. So you pull pieces of your lip away. So I learned, I learned that. And then I got where uh, I, I didn't like them at all. And I got a lot of ribbing too. That's a two prong dilemma there. I got a lot of ribbing, don't you ever smoke those things. And uh, also I found out in, I've been richly blessed to be in, in films 
uh, a few, and I found out <clears throat> the smoke from the cigar creates a very dramatic effect on film. So smoking the cigar enhances what the viewer is seeing on that screen. So I fire them up, you know, the, in the film we made just last week, there's, there, in that part of the scene, there's, I went through two cigars to film that, that scene. Uh, but I've got to brush my teeth and, and floss and use the gargle uh, for a couple of days. I, I sometimes think about taking a blowtorch to get the taste out of my mouth. Uh, but no, I'm not a smoker. Uh, I didn't have to learn how to smoke a cigar. You know, only a hardcore person with a death wish for cancer would inhale a cigar. Uh, but I smoked them only for the effect of the portrayal, either live or on on camera. And if you see me smoking a cigar, uh, you know that I have felt compelled to fire it up and, and get the dramatic smoke effect. All right. Um, Jason says, thank you for your performance at Grant College on last Friday. And Chris Bye. Long. Chris Long says that uh, he thought that A. Lincoln was our first civil rights president. Well, he was. He got it started, but he was he was murdered before he could put into effect uh, to any degree at all, if at all, his his civil rights plans. Uh, he he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, but he also had the ten percent plan where 10% of the voters of the 1860 census could vote to go back in the union. They did, four states did. Uh, and I, I think Texas was one of them, but uh, before Lincoln was murdered, uh, the Senate had kicked out those, the, the ratification of those four states. So before Lincoln was dead, they were already rolling back his programs. Uh, Grant was the, the, the president who was, and Andrew Johnson, I think it's a fair assessment to say Andrew Johnson had little interest in civil rights. And uh, when Grant became president, he wanted to protect and in, uh, the black citizens and to be sure that they could vote and assume full citizenship with all the rights and privileges there too. Uh, and he had a great deal of opposition in doing that. He's the first, I think he's the first civil rights president because he's the one that picked up the hammer and and got to work. Karen says, uh, Grant has received a bad rap through the years, um, although his ranking has improved uh, recently. Do you personally think Grant was a good president? I absolutely think Grant was a good president. Uh, and, and all, all of you should know <clears throat> that I'm a grant enthusiast, but I am definitively not a grant apologist. Uh, he had the warts and the foibles and the faults, and, and he screwed up more than a couple of times. But he had an extremely effective presidency. And that's why I go back to get a copy of Charles W. Calhoun's book, the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant and read it. Uh, it's a good read. Uh, it's intense. Now, it's in, I'm not putting you off, but know that when you read that book, it's deep, it's intense. Uh, but if you read that book, you get a, a, a refocusing of Grant's presidency because you see, Grant was fighting the radical Republicans uh, and couldn't get much of anything passed. Charles Sumner loathed him and he led the Senate until he got so bad the Senate finally threw him out, censured him, removed him from offices. Uh, Thad Stevens, he died fairly young, but Thad Stevens ruled the House with an iron hand and Thad Stevens didn't care much for Grant either. You had people like Ben Butler and Nathaniel Banks. You remember Nathaniel Banks from uh, 
Texas and Louisiana, the Red River campaign, telling Grant, I can't send you anybody because I'm involved in the Red River campaign. Maybe next month I'll send you something and Grant moved on without him. Uh, Nathaniel Banks is in Congress, Ben Butler's in Congress. So Grant had a, a tough road to hoe with the radical Republicans and people who remembered him from the war. Uh, and he, <clears throat> He did things like the, like the Treaty of Washington. He he signed that first legislation for Yellowstone Park. He did start the Panama Canal that ultimately resulted in what we have today for the mega vessels that we use. He uh, settled those Canadian fishing rights. He tried desperately to resolve the Indian issues without killing Indians uh, and he, he wasn't successful with that. He wasn't successful in what he tried to do with Reconstruction. But as a, a, a administration, his presidency was a good one. It's going to be rated, I think, in, in the uh, next decade. Uh, he's going to be rated as one of our top 10 presidents. And I think, given whom you, which person you're reading, he's going to be rated as one of our top five presidents. Uh, when he was, he left office, the lost cause theory was taking root and becoming a tsunami and the league is being lifted up. Now, history is no less uh, uh, subject to the laws of physics than liquid or solids. As, as one person is being raised up, as Lee's coming up, Grant's having to go down. You know, you can't, you can't have Lee and Grant at the, on the same level pedestal. So as Lee's being brought up, Grant's being put down, and that's also being driven and fueled by uh, a Senate and a Congress that many of them could, most of them could not abide Grant. Uh, then he vetoed uh, the inflation, the currency, the greenback currency bill, and that uh, was wanted by both sides, on and on and on. Uh, so Grant's presidency, and, and he was not involved in any of the controversies. In fact, Credit Mobilier, which exploded in his face, his presidential face, that started back in Lincoln's administration, uh, uh, if not before. And that's railroad greed, land baron greed. And all these, these things came home to roost while Grant was there uh, in, the, in the executive mansion. Grant's mistake was, uh, and he even addressed that when he talked about Ferdinand Ward financially ruining him. He said, I have always been wont to uh, forsake a man. I've trusted men much longer than I should have. Uh, and that has been too frequently to my detriment. Uh, and that was his downfall. Grant, he couldn't cut his friends loose. Uh, Grant was a good guy. He was genuinely a nice guy. And uh, that doesn't always serve one well in the executive mansion. Uh, and I, th I think that's the, the character trait that uh, the fault that character flaw that he had. He trusted people too long. There are many men in his administration that he should have tapped the top of his desk and said, I want your resignation before the end of the day. And he didn't do that with enough people and often enough. But he was a good president. Read the book, The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant by Charles W. Calhoun. Ray Barak uh, says, when at home with Lena, do you find it hard to, um, to have downtime and switch off and not talk about Grant, especially when having a meal with friends who are colleagues and uh, or reenactors? Most of the time with us here at home, uh, there's Grant something going on. It's a common interest. Now, Lena got into it. The first year that I did it, she was the camera monkey uh, running around taking all of the pictures because, of course, Grant can't be walking around with a camera. And all of the pictures that you see on my Facebook page or my website, uh, if you'll think about it, I don't take any of them, uh, certainly none of me. Uh, but after about a year of doing Grant, Lena came to me and said, hey, I, I like all those pretty dresses, too. Uh, I want to dress up. And she had also uh, caught fire with Julia. And she read her favorite book is uh, The President's Lady by Ishbel, I-S-H-B-E-L, Ishbel. It's an unusual name. Uh, 
Ishmael Ross, excellent book, excellent book about Grant. I, I, I refer to it myself frequently. But she read uh, The President's Lady, Ishmael Ross's book, and some other books about Lena, uh, Julia, and found out that she is a body double for Julia when they married. And uh, so she decided that she wanted to uh, get the pretty, it started out with the pretty dresses, and I don't know how many she's got. I, every time I ask, I get something like tra-la-la and around the corner and down the steps. Uh, but I've always told her, get what you want. Uh, I know she's got, she's got two closets full of gowns and dresses. And now she's got to buy even more because the, the women's clothing styles changed subtly, but significantly. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but the women's fashions of 1869 through 1877 are there's a significant enough change that she's going to have to buy uh, presidential uh, first lady wear and ball gowns of course she's her attitude is horrors don't tell me i have to buy more dresses uh, <laughs> but she she caught fire with julia and became enamored of julia and while she will not do presentations, she will answer questions. And so I'm frequently going to an event and I'll get a ringer in the audience and I'll say, ask Julia a question. And we're on the American Queen steamboats, the Duchess, the Queen, uh, uh, and other boats that they've got. Uh, she'll do presentations by the, by the numbers, by question and answer. And she's quite capable of talking for an hour. She's very knowledgeable about Julia. Uh, being home together, uh, downtime, before COVID, we were spending about 80% of our time on the road. Uh, and we're beginning to get back out into it again on the road. Saratoga, New York last week, for example, we're going to be out in Washington, Vancouver, Fort Vancouver and uh, Fort Humboldt in California and over the Labor Day weekend. Uh, and so we're going coast to coast and, and love it. But downtime is, is becoming hard to come by. And we like to, to sip the coffee and sit on the back. I had a back porch built across the house, 27 feet long and 12 feet wide. Got a big wooden back porch with a porch swing. Spend a lot of time in the swing. A lot of time drinking coffee and I got a lake behind the house. So got my own little walled and set up there. And uh, some we don't ever make a conscious effort not to talk Grant, but we're both so into the characters of Grant and Julia that it, the, the worlds meld together. Life is good at home at, at the executive residence or headquarters. Uh, Paul says, I admire much about Grant. His denigration of George Thomas is one of the few negatives, like his denial of fault uh, about Shiloh. I appreciate your mentioning Lou Wallace, whose service at Monocacy is one of my favorite Civil War stories. Lou Wallace uh, was a political general that uh, did well as a general. He learned quickly. Uh, Malacacy is one example. Another example that I know of is at Fort Donaldson on the morning of the 15th when I was, uh, Grant was, <laughs> when Grant was away visiting, meeting with uh, Andrew Hull Foote, that uh, I, I did not leave anybody in command. I, I said, don't bring on, he said, don't bring on an engagement, but uh, he wasn't figuring on the uh, breakout attempt. And Lou Wallace, without orders, finally saw the need to intervene. And as, as McClernand's being pushed back, savagely being pushed back, Wallace on his left cut in obliquely and hit the flank, the right flank of the Confederates, and was able to staunch the flow, uh, arterial flow of losses and of men and ground, and was able to push hope back and hold the line. So Wallace uh, and, and the second day at Shiloh, he did well. Uh, Wallace, Wallace was a, a, no doubt a patriot, uh, a very sincere patriot, and he learned his craft well. 
and Grant made mention of that in the memoirs. As he was dying, he was kind to Lou Wallace. So, uh, Kurt, we're running out of time uh, rapidly. I'm going to ask uh, several questions all at once. And here's the first one. <laughs> what was Grant's favorite drink? And um, uh, I understand that I have read two different places over the years that he had uh, apparently at some time said that Old Crow was his favorite drink, Old Crow bourbon uh, out of Kentucky. And Jim Beam makes it now. Uh, it used to be cheap crap, uh, your low end bourbon. But since Beam Distilleries got it, I understand they're making a, a, a different recipe and it's a better, a better bourbon. And, and where do you get your reenactors clothes? I get my reenactors clothes. I had some from C and D Jarnigan in uh, Corinth, Mississippi. I get all of my clothing, well, and I've dealt with South Union Mills in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Blockade Runner in uh, Bell Buckle, Tennessee, uh, and I deal with the Quartermaster Shop Limited in Kimball with two L's, Kimball, Michigan. It's near Saginaw, Michigan. Uh, all of my presidential clothing is from uh, Quartermaster Shop Limited. Now that's limited. You got the regimental quartermaster in Gettysburg. Uh, I've got my great coat that I wear came from the regimental quartermaster. Uh, if anybody wants to know the people that I deal with, send me a telegram and I'll be happy to tell you because I am a strong, staunch advocate. We need to support those who support us. Linda says, uh, go green, go white, go Sparty. <laughs> and Arena says, in what I have read about the execution of 22 Confederate deserters who then joined the Union Army and uh, were captured and ordered executed by General Pickett, is that Pickett and Grant did know each other before the war. Grant supported Pickett's pardon application to President Johnson, despite what he did. Okay, then, then you know more about that situation than I. I, I knew that there's the the uh, tragedy of Pickett ordering the hanging of those soldiers, uh, and I don't know. I understand they were federal deserters and went Confederate, and they were trying to desert from the Confederates back to the Federals. Not sure about that, but I know what 22 of them were hanged in a mass execution in North Carolina. As far as Pickett and Grant's uh, relationship and what Grant did, I'm not surprised about supporting a pardon application. Um, I, I, I am piqued now to learn more about the Grant and Pickett relationship such as it was or whatever it was. So our final comment is from Janine and she says, I believe you just indicated that you will be in Washington state area for the September long weekend for a presentation. And if so, are you able to provide more information on that? I ask because I live in Calgary and Washington is not uh, too far and hoping maybe I can catch you there. I don't know. Uh, John Hartman uh, might be of some help. I'm not sure. I know that they're, they're going to want me uh, to do a presentation. I did one year before last when I was out there. Uh, and I will happily do one or a couple of them. Those It's at the Fort Clatsop, C-L-A-T-S-O-P, the Fort Clatsop reenactment. Uh, and the, the Washington and the Oregon reenactors out there are just, I can't praise those folks enough. It, it was, they have a wonderful organization. They put together a first class reenactment. Uh, and and I, I couldn't have been more pleased to be involved in it. And I want to go back. Uh, what I will do to present will be forthcoming that's, that's still a little way off, but if you can come down from Vancouver, please do so. I'd love to meet you in person. And uh, there'll be at least one, probably two presentations that I'll do to a group. And then I'm always in the tent, under the tent fly, 
they have mail call up there and everybody has the letters that, that have been written to them. Uh, the coffee and dinner, coffee and breakfast. Uh, there's, I can't recall the name of the fellow that's their cook, but he makes a, a, a sandwich that'll make you get up and walk around the camp table a couple of times. It's so good. Uh, so I'm, I'm enthusiastically looking forward to going back out there and uh, I'll, I'll do probably several presentations. So if you can come down from Calgary, please come. We should love to see you there. Fort Clatsop is a great place. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us. And Kurt, as always, thank you for, uh, for your insights. And ladies and gentlemen, next Friday, be prepared for Fridays with Grant. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, Grant. Thank you.